Welcome to Choice Classic Radio, where we bring to you the greatest old-time radio shows. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and thank you for donating at choiceclassicradio.com. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Backlash. They sat at the table in silence, the dinner almost over. George Turner on one side and his wife, Jan, opposite him. George could feel the tension between them growing from the moment Jan's Aunt Irene had excused herself to take the telephone call. It was a difficult situation. George had always hated Aunt Irene with all his heart. Only the housing shortage and the prospect of rent-free lodging had induced George to bring Jan to Irene's home and humbly ask permission to stay there. Of course, it was difficult for a man like George to be humble under any circumstances. And by now he was telling himself that it would be the greatest of all possible pleasures to kill Aunt Irene with his bare hands. The muffled sound of her voice was still coming from the next room when George looked up from his tapioca pudding to find Jan watching him quietly. George. What? Well, I... I don't quite know how to say this, darling. Go ahead and say it. This is jump on George night, haven't you heard? No one's jumping on you, George. I just wish you'd try to understand. Uncle David means a great deal to me, you know. So what? What do you owe Uncle David? What's he ever done for you? Oh, is that the only unstandard you ever judge people by? What they've done for you? The point is that Uncle David's sick. And I feel that it's right to go to him. You mean Aunt Irene feels that it's right. It was her idea in the first place. Why not admit it? It was my idea too, George. Now listen to me, Jan. This is no time for you to travel 3,000 miles across the country to visit an ailing uncle. And don't give me that drivel about owing it to him. Unfortunately, it's not a matter of loyalty. It's a matter of geography. Is that clear? Yes, George. I suppose it is. Well, Aunt Irene? It was Uncle David's physician, Jan. Long distance. He says it's only a matter of days now. Thank heaven. Oh, George. At least we'll have something new to talk about at dinner. George Turner, he's... Aunt Irene, please. Well, I wonder what Uncle David thinks. He's always thought the world and all of you, Jan. Why, please, Aunt Irene. I'd rather not talk about it now. Of course, dear. I know how disappointed you must be. After all, Uncle David... Irene, will you forget Uncle David? I will not, George Turner, and don't you dare use that tone of voice on me. This is my house. Good Lord, you have to throw that in my face every night at dinner. Oh, you're just like your brother, aren't you? You look enough alike to be twins, and what's worse, you're cut from the same cloth. Oh, and Irene... Don't stop her, Jan. Don't stop her. She loves it. Like a kid sticking a pin through a bug. Your brother Ed's a criminal. I put him where he belongs. Sure, Ed's a criminal. He belongs in prison. But that's not the point. 
The really horrible part is the morbid delight that showed on your face, dear Aunt Irene, the day you took the stand and sent him up. Everything I testified was true. Yes. But the only thing that never came out was your reason. You thought if Ed went up, I'd be ruined and Jan would leave me. Stop it, George. Oh, no. Let's have it all out on the table. You testified against Ed, hoping it would get Jan away from me. You let us come to live here so you'd have a better chance to get Jan away from me. Now you wanted to go 3,000 miles across the country just so you can get her away from me. That's not true. Not a word of it. But by heaven, you've given me an idea. If I thought I could save Jan from the misery you bring down on her head, I'd... I'd... So at last it comes out. Well, go ahead, Irene. Do your darndest. But I'll warn you in advance, it won't work. It won't work because my brother Ed and I are cut from the same cloth. Remember? Yes, George, it's all out on the table. And as you stomp out of the house and walk alone down the street of the dark elm-lined street and try and cool off, it all goes round and round in your mind. You know that Irene means what she says. After a quarrel like that, she will try to separate you from Jan. And you know, too, that you'll never let that happen. That you won't stand by and lose the only person in the world, uh, yourself accepted, who ever meant anything to you. So the idea begins to grow, George. And the next day at the office, it's still there, like a hangover. And you find it hard to concentrate on your work. Anderson's usually pretty thorough in covering his territory. Pretty hard to see how he could have missed Brad, Charles. Uh, George. Oh, oh uh, yeah, Martin. Uh, that was, uh, what account was that? Bradshaw. Oh, yeah, uh, Bradshaw. That's at uh, San Vicente. What are you talking about? Bradshaw drugged at Midfield. Oh. You've been on these books long enough to know that. Of course, sure. I- I'm sorry, Martin. I just... Mrs. Turner. Yes? There's a man to see you. Excuse me, Martin. Hey. Who is he? Well, he wouldn't give me his name. Why not? Over there at the counter. The little man in the dark suit. Thanks. Yes, sir? You're George Turner? That's right. I, uh... Run across a little item I thought you might be interested in. Fifty cent piece with a hole in it. What? Where? Seen it before? Where did you get it? A friend. That's all? Just this? A note comes with it. Want to take a look? Let me see it, quick. Take it easy. The dame over there is looking at us. Here. You, uh, interested? Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested. Good. Room 238, Franklin Hotel. 10 tomorrow morning. He picks up the note and leaves, pausing a moment at the office door to toss you a wink. And you look again at the 50-cent piece with a hole in it. It's like a magic charm, isn't it, George? The minute you saw it, the dull ache inside you vanished. Aunt Irene, the crisis. Jan's trip west. It was all unimportant after all, wasn't it? Yes. That 50 cent piece is going to make everything so simple. Uh, Martin. Yes? Uh, you won't mind if I knock off for a few minutes, will you? Yeah, why not? I'll be right back. My wife's going west, you know, probably tomorrow. And, uh... I thought you'd talk her out of it. Oh, not a chance. It's her favorite uncle and all that. Uh, I want to pick up a corsage for at the florist. And uh, another thing, uh, Martin, where was that place you bought the candy the other day? That was the best candy I ever tasted. Oh, uh, Valentine's on 8th Street. Oh, yeah. Great. I uh, want to get a box for Aunt Irene. It's about time I did something for the old girl. With the prologue of Backlash, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now here's an important announcement about a change in time for The Whistler beginning next Monday. The Whistler will be heard each week one hour earlier at 8 o'clock instead of 9. 
Remember, beginning next Monday, The Whistler, one hour earlier. Eight o'clock instead of nine. Friends, at the beginning of this program, you hear me say, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage, and signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. But just what does signal mean by that word quality? Well, translated into driving language, gasoline quality means quicker starts, faster pickups, smoother, knock-free power. In order for signal to give you that kind of performance, the thrill of alert, surging power that puts extra pleasure into driving, signal gasoline must help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you naturally get extra mileage. That's why signal says your best yardstick of gasoline quality is your speedometer. Check yours, and you'll find it's true. In gasoline, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Good reason why drivers who want the tops in gasoline quality and those who appreciate extra value are switching to Signal. And now back to the whistler. It was an amazing thing, wasn't it, George? Just last night, it seemed intolerable, with nothing ahead but dreary months of fencing with a vicious, dominating woman, of silent, tense evenings at the dinner table, while she picked away at the heart of your marriage to Jan, of useless rages and long, lonely walks in the night. But it's over now. You can see daylight ahead, and the thing that made the difference jingles in your pocket. The 50-cent piece with a hole in it that the furtive little man left with you this afternoon. You arrive home on schedule, a box of chocolates in Jan's corsage held playfully behind your back. Anybody home? Jan! Aunt Irene! Oh, there you are. Good evening, George. Oh, hello, Aunt Irene. Where's Jan? She'll be down in a minute. Close the door, it's drafty. I have something to tell you, George. Great, I'm listening. I had a long talk with Jan today. Oh? We decided, we, mind you, not I, that you're entirely unfair about the trip. I see. George, Jan is leaving tomorrow to visit Uncle David, and nothing you will say will change her mind. Is that clear? Of course. Well, well is that all you're going to say? I think it's a wonderful idea. The trip will do her good. George, George, I want you to try and understand, darling. Understand? That... <laughs> What's there to understand? Well, uh, well, you see, Aunt Irene decided... I just told him. Oh? Well, George, you see, I... He thinks it's a fine idea. What? Of course, dear. I know when I'm wrong. Well, I can't be right all the time, can I? George, what a... Ne- Wait a minute. What are you hiding behind your back? Peace offering. For you, darling. Oh, a corsage. Well, after all, my wife's going to travel in style. Oh, what oh, is God. this, George? And for you, Aunt Irene, a box of chocolates. Tell me, what have you got in the back of your head now? It's very simple, Aunt Irene. I know I said some intolerable things last night, and I'm sorry. I've thought it over very carefully and decided you were completely right. Hmm. It's unfair of me to keep Jan from making the trip. That's all. You expect me to believe that? I've been wrong about a lot of things, Aunt Irene. I want to change now. I hope you'll try and understand when I tell you it's going to be different from now on. Oh, George, it's it's wonderful. (laughs) When are you leaving, Jan? Tomorrow morning at 10.30. Oh. Uh, You'll forgive me if I don't see you off. Of course, George. Aunt Irene will drive me to the station. Well, thanks, dear. You see, I I have a very important appointment at 10 o'clock. Ten o'clock. Right on time, Turner. Come in. Thanks. Uh, this is Mr. Frawley, uh, Dan George Turner. Uh, how do you do? Sit down, Turner. Thanks. We uh, dropped the four-bit piece along with my note to let you know this is the McCoy. 
recognized it, I see. Yeah? That's my brother Ed's pocket piece. He's carried it for years. Mm -hmm. Ed's a nice boy. Shame to see him wasting his life away on a murder rap. Yeah. And uh, Dan here likes to help nice guys. <laughs> Just like he said in the note. Yeah, we want to get your brother out, Mr. Turner. That takes an organization, doesn't it? We got one. Takes money, too. Prison breaks don't come cheap. How much? Three thousand bucks. Three thousand? Maybe it's not worth that much to you to see your brother sprint. Maybe you don't like your brother. No, it's not that. Uh, you said he was a nice guy, Crawley. Uh, tell me, does he still have red hair, or has prison life turned it gray? <laughs> yeah, I get it. You don't trust us, huh? Yeah, your brother doesn't have red hair, Turner, or gray. Sandy, like yours. About the same height and the same build. In fact, you could pass for him. Does that satisfy you? I've seen him? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you've seen him all right. But... You, um, you think you'd recognize your brother's handwriting? Why, well, certainly I would. Okay. Take a look at this letter. George, this folly is okay. I know you've never liked me, but please make a deal with him. Someday I'll pay you back. Thanks, Ed. Satisfied? Yeah. But how'll this thing work? That's our end. Don't you worry. We got a case and it can't miss. When's this thing coming off? Don't know yet. But you can count on this. Twelve hours after it comes off, we figure to have your brother in Mexico. I see. Uh, you want to think it over for a while? No. No, I've done all the thinking over I have to. But, uh, I'll have to scout around to get that money. I can have it for you in 24 hours. Okay? Okay, Turner. It's a deal. Yes, George, it's a deal. A completely new deal for you. Because for once in your life, you hold a hand that's all aces. And as you go about raising the necessary $3,000, using your wife's trip as an excuse, you plan exactly how you'll play your cards. With Jan safely on her way to California, the next day you manage to get the money to fall in. Then, after three days of anxiously watching the newspapers, you're driving home from work with your next-door neighbor, Mr. Cameron. The car radio playing softly as the two of you talk. Ah, well, I'm always glad when we're out of that traffic. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, I was reading an article on that, George. Some psychologists claim that half our nervousness is due to the increased traffic since the war. Yes, I read that. They uh, blamed the other half on living with relatives. Why... <laughs> yes, so they did. <laughs> well, of course, it's a lot of foolishness with some people. Your case, for instance. Your wife's Aunt Irene is a fine woman, George. She's all right. Sometimes I... Well, I don't think you understand her exactly. You know, we think a good deal of her down at the garden club. Mm, well, she may be fine at the garden club. But... Uh, now, wait a minute, George. Before you say anything against Let's Irene... Let's skip it. I, can... I don't want to talk about her anymore. George, I... This is Tom Daly with a special item. Let's catch this, huh? During daylight break, three prisoners escaped from the state penitentiary this morning, killing one guard and wounding three others. Mm -hmm. Two of the fugitives have already been taken into custody by the swift work of state and county officers. The third, however, is still at large. This man is Edward Turner, 37, uh -oh. a lifetime killer. Turner is said to be armed and dangerous. He is thought to be... I... I am sorry, George. That's your brother, isn't it? Yes. I guess I better hurry up and get home. There may be some calls or something. Yes, George, you want to get home in a hurry now. But not for any calls. You want to make sure that Aunt Irene's there. That she'll stay in the house. You also want to get up to the attic and pick up that old bundle of your brother Ed's clothes stored away in a trunk. That's the first thing you take care of. Then you hurry downstairs again to find Aunt Irene pacing the floor. Well, uh, something wrong, Aunt Irene? You know perfectly well what's wrong. Oh, uh, you heard the news on the radio, too. 
I don't suppose you were going to tell me. Well, I didn't see any point in alarming you. It'll be in the paper soon enough. You'd like Ted to come here, wouldn't you? You're probably counting on oh, it. Oh, now, please, Aunt Irene. Haven't I been trying my best to get along? He'll... He'll try to kill me. He swore he would that day in the courtroom. Now, Aunt Irene, he wouldn't try anything that foolish. Why, all the police in the state will be watching this area. This amuses you, doesn't it, George? The fact that I want a Jan to go away, that I'm alone in this house. You're not alone. I'll be here. And if it'll make you feel any better, uh... I'll phone my friend, Lieutenant Andrews. I'll tell him you want police protection. You, you'd really do that for me, George? Why, sure. So, just take it easy, Aunt Irene. Everything's going to be perfectly all right. You don't intend to phone, do you, George? You get Irene to go to her room, and then you sneak down to your car in the alley where you left it. You toss the bundle of clothes into the back and drive to a secluded spot at the edge of town. It doesn't take long to change from your suit into the old one of Ed. And a bit of dirt rubbed on your face makes the disguise more perfect. You're thinner than Ed, yes. But even Frawley remarked how much you look alike. Back in town, you run the car into an alley, cut the lights, and walk the few short blocks to Grinelli's Bar a place that has changed very little since the days when Ed used to hang around. This is an important step, George. You must establish Ed's presence in town. Hello, boys. Surprised to see me? Watch it, Grinelli. Don't do anything foolish. You see, I haven't got anything to lose. You have. Ed, hey, you you gotta go quick, Ed. The police will be... The police are figuring I'm a hundred miles from here. What do you want? I'm short of cash, Grinelli. Very short. I thought you'd like to give me 50 bucks. No, no, no. I, I can't do that. I can't help a criminal. Ed, they... So you believe it, too, huh? All that lying old dame had to say. Well, you had a fair trial. Sure, man. and they hung it on me. So now I want a fair chance to even things up and beat it. The money, Grinelli. Get it out of the register. But, Dad... Ed... Get it! All right. I'll, I'll get it. This is no good, Ed. They could close me down. So could I. Thanks. Just don't any of you do anything until I'm away from here. I wouldn't like it. And maybe killing comes easier for me now. It wasn't easy, George. But you know as you hurry back to your car that there were four people in that bar who will swear Ed Turner was in town tonight, at large. Five minutes later, you pull into a service station... Change clothes in the washroom and scrub the dirt from your face. No one pays any attention as you toss the little bundle of Ed's clothes in the back of a truck which is pulled in for gas. The next thing is your alibi, just in case something should go wrong. You drive over to the theater in your own neighborhood. The picture is one you saw a week ago on a business trip. Before going in, you purposely stop and chat a minute with the manager. Then you go inside. Take a seat near the fire exit and sit down to wait. Half an hour later, you decide it's time. You get up unnoticed and walk toward the fire door, fumbling in your pocket. Your hand lights on the 50-cent piece. And as you slip out, you insert it carefully into place, holding back the latch. Yes, George. You'll want to be able to get back to the theater when the night's business is over. After you've murdered Aunt Irene. It's only a few minutes to the house from the theater. You walk with quick, determined steps. This part won't be difficult, will it, George? No. You can't wait to walk in on her. Hey. Wait a minute, what's... Hello, George. What's the matter, Lieutenant Andrews? A little late to be getting home from work, isn't it? What? No, I, I was home before. I, I I just went out for a little walk. What brought you back, George? Forget something? Or did you want to make sure your wife's aunt was dead?
Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since this is spring, the season when a young man's thoughts turn to love, and also to oil changes, if he has a car, I'd like to say a word tonight on both subjects. Uh, love, that is, and oil changes. If you really love your car and want to keep it young, happy, and purring with contentment, make this spring's oil change a change for the better. In short, make it a change to that amazing new type signal lubricant that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor, signal premium motor oil. You see, because it combines five scientific new compounds with 100% pure paraffin base, signal premium motor oil does much more than just lubricate. In fact, tests prove Signal Premium actually keeps motor six times cleaner and reduces cylinder wear one-third. So remember, if you want a sweeter running motor, if you want to keep wear down and performance up, the oil to change to this spring is Signal Premium Motor Oil. And the place to get it? Your friendly neighborhood signal service station. And now back to the Whistler. <laughs> Well, George, you stand there speechless, stunned, almost as if someone had struck you with a sledgehammer when you walked through the door. Aunt Irene lying on the floor, dead. Andrews from the homicide squad staring at you, his lean face full of questions. You never figured it this way, did you, George? Not with Frawley's promise that they'd have Ed in Mexico 12 hours after his prison break. But now it begins to make sense, doesn't it? Ed must have decided not to leave without evening the score with Aunt Irene. You take your time, thinking it all through before saying anything. And then you realize that it's better this way. Ed's safely out of town by now, but he'll be blamed if you simply say you saw him. And you can say that, George, because Grinelli and those people in the bar will back you up. Yes. It's better this way. You want to tell us what happened, George? Yeah, yeah, sure, Andrews. It was just an awful shock, that's all. I I guess it's pretty simple. My brother, Ed, he was in town this evening. You talked to him? No, I saw him, though. I don't think there could be any mistake. And, of course, you know how he felt about Aunt Irene. Yeah, we know. Only we're more interested in how you felt about her, George. What do you mean? Mr. Cameron here says you hated her enough to kill her. Wait a minute. You're not accusing me That's of... That's exactly what I'm doing. Yes, only last week at the Garden Club. I mean... Yeah, yeah, you... you've told us all that, Mr. Cameron. All right, so we did quarrel, so I hated her, but that doesn't mean I killed her. He's lying, Lieutenant. I heard her scream. I heard him run out of the house. It was my brother. It, it, it must have been my brother. He swore he'd kill her. You've got to find him. He's on his way to Mexico. He's on his way, all right, but not to Mexico. He was killed less than an hour ago in a running battle with the police. That doesn't make any difference. I tell you, he came right, here. George, we know you're lying. You see, four witnesses are ready to swear that at the exact moment of the murder, your brother was downtown in Grinelli's bar. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Each Monday at 9, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And now let me remind you once more, beginning next Monday, The Whistler will be heard one hour earlier, 8 o'clock instead of 9. Featured in tonight's story were Howard Duff and Henrietta Tedrow. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch, story by J. Douglas Ware, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>